My name is Paul Francis. All right, and uh, Paul, are we alone in the universe? I don't know. When I asked you that question, what did you understand by the word we? Uh, we as in, I guess, both humanity and all the life forms on Earth, given we're all one family. Do you think we know what all the life forms on Earth are? No. Uh, we, I don't know what fraction we know. There's probably an awful lot of bugs and microbes we don't know about yet, let alone things deeply underground. But everything that's been discovered so far, which is probably a representative some set, subset at some level, uh, shares the same molecular structure, so it's all part of the same family. So a lot of biologists uh, say, oh, viruses are not alive. Some people say viruses are alive. So if we found some viruses on another planet, would that mean we were alone or we were not alone or what? Would that answer the question? Well, viruses can't reproduce without something else to reproduce on. So if there were viruses, there has to be something else, I'd say. If you found viruses by themselves, then that would raise all sorts of interesting questions um, about how they got there and what they're doing there, which uh, uh, would be interesting enough. I wouldn't, wouldn't need to care too much about whether they're alive or not, I think. So like an RNA world, for example, is often a viral world, and that would be one without parasites, but you would have essentially DNA. So if we found an RNA world like we imagine was at the origin of life on Earth, would we call that we found life or not? Uh, I, I think... I think you know, it doesn't make sense to divide up life, non-life, so sharply. That there is... Uh, and that's not a particularly meaningful question. I mean, you can come up with a definition, you can look up a definition in a book, and according to that definition, say, yes, this is or is not life. But if we discovered an RNA world, that would be extremely interesting because it meant that the chemical evolution had got from the primitive amino acids and things as far as RNA, and that would be very interesting itself. And like, I'm happy to leave it up to the dictionary writers to decide whether that's defined as life or not, but I would find it very interesting. Okay, so I asked you a question, are we alone? And your answer was? I don't know. And why don't you know? Because we have yet to measure or detect if there is any life out there or anything that could even possibly be called life anywhere other than the Earth. And so we have no direct experimental data. Uh, and I don't think the theory is good enough to tell us that. We now know there are lots of planets, probably a fair number of them, which are at least potentially habitable. What we don't know is if you do have a planet with the right temperature, with the right chemical composition, whether life gets started or not. Some uh, people, we don't know for sure. I think it's probably quite likely that it gets started, but there could easily be any number of showstoppers we don't understand at this point. A lot of people are interested in the question, are we alone, because they want to have somebody else to communicate with, almost a search for God or something. And when confronted with the idea of maybe we'll find just microbes elsewhere, they say, well, we'll still be alone. What is your view on that? How do, how do you define alone when I asked you the question, are we alone? Uh, well, I think there are different levels of interest. I mean, clearly meeting or communicating with a species that you can actually communicate with, as opposed to mopping up on the floor with a sponge, would be far more interesting than microbes. I think that microbes in space, if they had an independent evolutionary origin from us, would be extremely interesting, but probably only to the scientists. Biologists, usually. Physicists, I think, are more interested in communicating with some godlike creature who's yes. going to answer their questions. But clearly, if we could find somebody, who could, a godlike creature who could talk to us, that would be... Uh, um, a what? A godlike creature that could talk to us in a way that we might understand, which presumably means it's something close to our evolutionary level. Presumably, a godlike creature could be too godlike if there are, uh, if you imagine something that's a, a billion years more evolved than us. Uh, something that's a billion years less evolved than us, like a microbe, you can't have a very interesting conversation with. But if evolution does keep going, which is very unclear at the moment, then what would something look like if it's a billion years more advanced than us and would we be able to have a conversation with that is an interesting question. So you think that we are godlike compared to our ancestors a billion years ago? Yes. I think we are beyond the comprehension of a microbe. Not that you really, a microbe could really comprehend anything that doesn't have a brain. And so godlike you're defining as being beyond the comprehension of? Yes, yeah, one way you can define it. Okay. Now, is the question, are we alone, an important question? Yes. Uh, I think uh, from a practical point of view, I would say it's a high risk, high reward sort of question to study. If there are intelligent life forms that we can communicate with, the payoff in all sorts of aspects, philosophical, technological, scientific, would be incredible. But the odds of it actually being able to communicate with them is very low. So what you do with your one in a million chance, but the payoff is trillions of dollars. 
Um, it's also very philosophically interesting uh, to understand our place in the world and the universe. Is it the most interesting question you can think of? No, it's probably number two after why does the universe exist? Why does the universe exist? <laughs> That's your number one question. Why does the universe exist? Yes. I see. <laughs> why is there something rather than nothing? Okay, well, okay, we can talk about that later. But well, no, no, actually, I, I, might, I might rank is there a god up there as a very, other, well, very interesting minute, question. But wait a minute, but yesterday I was giving a talk to some, these high school students and I said that question, why is there something rather than nothing, is a useless question, totally meaningless. And the reason I said that was because it's assuming that nothing is more fundamental than something. That's the assumption behind that question. And that's the, a totally illegitimate assumption, as far as I'm concerned. Well, like all really interesting questions, we can't even ask the question properly. Any well, question that's really interesting is a hard one to define. If you could define the question properly, you'd already be most of the way to answering it, I think. So the very fact that this question, you can phrase it in many different ways. So you can use ambiguity as a virtue rather than a vice. <laughs> Well, I mean, as a scientist, you're always looking for questions that you don't know the answers to because no one's going to pay you to research things that you do know the answers to. And a large part of being a good scientist is asking the right questions and asking them in a way that makes sense. So I think both the question of is there life in space and the question of why, is there something rather than nothing in the universe are questions we don't really know how to ask properly yet. For is there life in space, the question is we don't really know what life in space might be like. Uh, and is there something rather than nothing? No, we why is there something rather than nothing? Why is there something mm -hmm. rather than nothing? It's not at all clear, as you said, whether something is more in need of explanation than nothing. Yes, that's, uh, I, that's why I, that, I'm confident of that, but you don't seem to be confident. that. Uh, we're in the realm of gut feelings. I mean, my gut feeling is that we live in a universe of awe-inspiring complexity, and to my mind, things that are that complicated require an explanation, whereas things that are very simple often don't. Nothing, in this, is, is I would regard, as somewhat simpler than our gloriously complicated, wonderful universe. But of course, that is an assumption. There's no justification for that. But there's also no justification against it. All right. Uh, this, the scientific story of Genesis, the big picture, is that important? And not just the question, are we alone, but how about the scientific story of how we got here? Because that's part of the answer to how other life forms may have gotten into the universe. I mean, that's a, a, a important to who and for what. Is it uh, important to you? Yes, but I'm a scientist and I'm incurably curious. Uh, I know this drives many of my friends insane. Why do you care about these things? Many people would say, well, I can't make a dollar out of it, so why do I care? If you take that point of view, then yes, it probably doesn't matter where life came from if you can't make a dollar out of it. If you're a curious person and want to know how the universe came about and why, then it makes a big difference. If you believe in that the way we learn things is by experimentation and trial and error and testing hypotheses, then you would believe in the scientific story of Genesis. If, on the other hand, you believe that the correct way to learn about things is direct revelation from God into your mind, then you take a different point of view. So the money people are saying, uh, whoever dies with the most money wins, and you say, whoever dies with the most knowledge wins? Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. Does um, does this make you a better person because you know a little bit more about... Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> In what way? I mean, let's say. No, it makes me a happier person because I'm curious. Uh, better, I mean, I don't think I want to go down the rabbit hole of ethics. Uh -huh. Okay, no rabbit hole of ethics. All right, what part of your research is most relevant to answering the question, are we alone? At the moment, my research is primarily about education. Mm -hmm. So, uh, why we're alone is of importance, first of all, because it's very interesting to many people and therefore would be a hook to get people interested in issues about More science. important questions? <laughs> um, well, I mean, from the government's point of view, it might get children hooked on science and they can therefore um, end up work as engineers and make money and raise tax revenue. So even from the fi purely financial point of view, this is important because it's uh, deeply interesting to many people. Couldn't you say that uh, your research, the most relevant part of your research is that you're educating a lot of people who will then make progress on answering the question, are we alone? Yes. Okay, you're happy with that. I'm happy with that. <laughs> okay. There's um, the famous uh, uh, quote, um, where a physicist was asked uh, what contribution his research made to the defense of America. And his argument was, it's the sort of thing that makes America worth defending. Right, that was a Cornell particle physicist who said that. If I gave you $100 billion with the caveat that you had to spend it 
to help answer the question or try to answer the question, are we alone? How would you spend it? 100 billion. 100 billion is quite a lot. Um, How would you spend it? I think for a clear art, well, you could spend a very small fraction of that on doing SETI type projects much better than we currently are having. You know, 1% of that would give you some very good. A billion sense. dollars into SETI would be boo. Yes. Um, and likewise, maybe two or three billion dollars would get you some good sample or return missions to a bunch of planets, which would be like Mars or solar system planets. Solar system planets, uh, which might get you the answer or might not. Uh, to really get a more definitive answer, you're going to have to look at some other solar systems, and maybe a hundred billion would uh, get you a probe that could uh, visit a few nearby solar systems. Okay, so you're going to visit a few nearby solar systems. How about uh, microscopes? Um, Looking for nano aliens in this room, for example. Again, a very small fraction of that would probably do that. <laughs> um, okay. I'd, uh, it's not. I, I have doubt that there would be flourishing non related to our species simply because they would have to compete evolutionarily with the flourishing related to our species. And it's even if they had land on Earth at some point they would be competing against the very well-evolved species that already had adjusted to their environment. So even if nano-aliens did arrive on Earth, I suspect they wouldn't last long, and the signs of them would be very difficult to spot. How about might we already be inside of an alien, kind of like your neurons are inside of your brain and the neurons don't know that they're inside of your brain. Could we be like inside of an alien and not know it? Yes, but I'm not sure how an experiment's going to tell us that. <laughs> I don't know. It's kind of like what was that movie about the guy who was, who was in a who was being filmed all the time, and then uh, anyway, we could maybe sail off into the till we meet the skull. The Truman Show. <laughs> that, that's right, the Truman Show. And he found out that he was in this movie only by sailing towards the horizon yeah. where it was painted. Well, I guess a neuron would have to learn how to migrate inside your skull and come to a, a wall. Yes. Well, of course, it could well be we're in some computer simulation. A number of people have speculated that. How can uh, we verify that? How can we determine? We'd have to find the flaw in the simulation. Uh, floor? Yeah, I mean, it's so a simulation. So like Heisenberg's uncertainty principle? Uh, well, you'd have to be, um, if the if simulation is perfect, then in the, by definition there is no way we can tell we're in it. So there'd have to be some clues hidden in the simulation that we could work out. But if it were perfect, then it wouldn't matter, would it? That's a very good philosophical question. Uh, does it matter if we're just a simulation, if it's a suitably good one or not? Um, I think it matters philosophically to us. But we want to be in, uh, because of the illusion of control, maybe. Uh, if you're interested in making money, that doesn't matter. Okay, all right. All right. Now, you know what Fermi's paradox is. Indeed. Do you have a favorite solution to Fermi's paradox? Where is everybody? My favorite solution is that all the aliens are sufficiently advanced that they're leaving us alone. That's no. simply because it's not most of the other solutions I find depressing. <laughs> so, the in, in zoo oh, so in terms of, in terms of uh, I mean, the most likely solution in my th to my mind would be either that alien civilizations are extremely rare and therefore so far spaced out that there's not much chance of interaction between them on the likely time scale, um, or that... Oh, wait, well, let me stop you there. The, the time scale, if it's in our galaxy, yeah. then we have plenty of time in 12 billion years in the history of... Earth-like planets, and then, you know, the average Earth is about two billion years older than our Earth, that would give plenty of time, even if moving slowly, to explore the whole galaxy. Well, the question is how long civilizations remain at an exploring phase. So that and is a, your preferred so solution, then? And uh, so that's the relevant time scale. I mean, given that humanity has been in the uh, colonizing frame of mind for maybe uh, 100,000 years or so, since the first out of Africa, maybe a bit longer than that, maybe half a million, um, which is a very, very small fraction of the age of the galaxy. Um, so let's say we remain for another half million, then the question is not how far can you get given unlimited time, but how far can you get in a million years? And then if you only have like five intelligent civilizations in our galaxy, it could well be they won't encounter each other on that sort of time scale. Um, so, so wait a minute, I'm, I'm confused here. Now, are you saying that a solution to the Fermi's paradox is because of the lifetime of the civilization, or A, because we're the first one? in the galaxy or the universe to get this kind of technology? I find it unlikely we're the first ones. So, uh... Why? Well, I guess it depends on the, uh... what you think of the, 
the inevitability of going from microcellular life to intelligence. Uh, so if you believe that's an incredibly unlikely fluke, and that most, I think it's probably quite likely that most uh, a fraction of suitable planets will develop microscopic life, what's I think far less clear is what fraction of that microscopic life would evolve into something we can have a conversation with. We know that that evolution took you know, four billion years or so on Earth. Um, can we have conversations with other critters on Earth? Only the, ones that, only the ones that are pretty close to us in the evolutionary terms. So, I mean, yes, we can probably have conversations with dolphins and monkeys and dogs. But they also took four billion years to evolve. Anything that only took three billion years to evolve, we can't have a conversation with. Do you think that's something that you're, you're implying, that you can take that time scale and, and project it onto life elsewhere? Well, it's a puzzle why that time scale is so similar to the lifespan of our planet. So, I mean, our planet will be habitable for about six billion years until the sun gets too warm to boil off the oceans two billion years or so from now. And, and that's determined by nuclear physics and gravity in the sun. Whereas the time scale to evolve intelligent life forms is determined by completely different physics. It's to do with biochemistry and chemical reaction rates and evolution. And so there's no particular reason why these two numbers should be even within a hundred orders of the magnitude of each other. And so one way in which you can force them to be the same is if you say on average the time taken to evolve intelligent life is much longer than the lifespan of planets and it's only like one in a million fluke where it's short enough. And in that case you'd expect most evolution, most evolution of intelligent life to happen close to the end of the period of in inhabitants of that planet. Mm -hmm. Am I making any sort of sense here? Yeah, yeah, that's a Brandon well Carter's argument, argument yeah. I think. So, what is your best guess for the kind of aliens that might exist in the universe, elsewhere in the universe? I have no idea. Um, I think well, you just said several times microbes more than intelligent aliens. I would imagine so. I mean, even on Earth, microbes vastly outnumber us. So uh, I would imagine that there's a, um, a leaky pipeline. That you're, you're starting off with Earth-like planets, and then only some fraction of them will develop primitive microorganisms, only some fraction go on to develop, say, photosynthesis, and only some fraction of that develop multicellular, mm -hmm. and all the way down the probability goes down. So I'd say that the most likely, uh, the most likely origin, the most likely life forms to find are the most primitive ones. Uh, and then each time you get a step more, quote, advanced, then you're going to find less and less of them. But when you become very advanced and send out spacecraft, then you'll see them all over the place. True. So I'm talking about how often they originated. If they then start spreading, then you'd expect whichever one is to spread the most to be the most common one. Which would be the one that's most advanced and can produce spaceships that travel all over and colonize everything. I mean, a lot of people think that we should not be looking on planets for organic life. We should be looking for, you know, robots and satellites uh, traveling between stars and things rather than concentrate on, you know, habitable planets and atmospheres and biosignatures. What is your take on that dichotomy? Um... Well, I think the, we have to be careful about whether evolution in the normal sense still applies when you reach a level of intelligence. So at the pre-intelligent level, evolution encourages things that spread and breed like crazy. So it could well be that actually a better, in whatever sense, life form is one that just sits around contemplating its navel and thinking deep thoughts. However, that will get elbowed out by the one that breeds like crazy and spreads like crazy. Now, when you get to the stage of spreading around the galaxy and intelligence, it's not clear that dynamic works anymore. That there may be... Uh, so the idea that a natural stage for anything once it reaches intelligence is to spread like crazy and send out colonizing things may be totally untrue. Uh, we really do not know what the long-term behavior of intelligent species is. We have not been intelligent enough to know very much in any way. We're only one data point. So I really think we have no idea we have no real, comp we're really barely intelligent ourselves. We've, we've just about made it over the threshold we consider to be intelligent. Um, and we may well slip back below it at some point. So it's very hard to see, very hard for us to imagine what intelligent life forms on time scales of millions or tens of millions of years, which is what you need to colonize the galaxy, are actually going to be like. Would they spread like crazy? <coughs> Presumably some will, some won't, but uh, there are many science fiction novels about this. But, but if you have at least one, then it's the one that you're going to contact. Well, it could be that the limiting factor is self-destruction. Right. And so it could be that uh, 
99.9% of intelligent species destroy themselves, and so the ones you're likely to see are the ones that have some built-in resistance to self-destruction. And it could be the expansionist ones have that resistance because they spread themselves so widely they can't destroy themselves, but it could be that their destructive capability outranges their ability to spread. Mm. And so these ones are far more likely to wipe themselves out. So it could be at this point that the, uh, the navel-gazing philosophical ones, because they might have a lower chance of self-destruction, might be the ones that have longevity. Now, given the fact that we haven't detected aliens, and Nick Bostrom has said if we detect an, a life, an independently originated life on Mars, that would be the worst news ever, because then we would be sure that the life, we're going to kill ourselves, because we don't see anything that's still alive, and we see life originating everywhere, and that means that self-destruction becomes much more of a, the de rigueur, the, something that we should not look forward to. That would be evidence for self our own self-destruction. It could be evidence of that, but it could be evidence for many other things as well. I mean, I think a very likely hypothesis is that the life stays at the microcellular level. And so if you've got to find microcellular life on Mars, um, it could be that the threshold is not, they become intelligent and then destroy themselves. The threshold is they, they never make it to, from single cellular to multicellular. Um, so there are many other possible thresholds. And as I said, it could be that once things are intelligent, there are other reasons why they don't spread around the galaxy other than okay. self-destruction. Now, I'd like to talk to the irrational part of Paul Francis for a second. So could you close your eyes, <laughs> turn, on your, turn off the irrational part, turn up the irrational part, like close your eyes, whatever you need to do, and, and I'm going to say, what kind of aliens would you like to find emotionally? Forget rational. Ah, oh, I'd like to find intelligent, benevolent ones. Intelligent, intelligent, benevolent ones. How benevolent? Do you want ones that give you money, that give you hugs, that uh, what? What? Are the, how are they going to help? Yes, you? all of the above. All of the above. <laughs> Not kill you. Yes. I see. But you don't need the hugs or what? Hugs would be nice. How about sex? You want? It's like a lot of young men watch movies like Avatar, for example, for the sex with the aliens or something. I suspect any aliens are going to be so unlike us that sex with them would not be palatable. Well, do you, haven't you seen Superman or Star Trek? I've seen any number of science fiction <laughs> movies, but sorry, I'll put the rational side of my brain away again. <laughs> okay. All right. Anyway, so benevolent ones. Any form? Do you want them about our size or you want them tiny, tiny? you want them as big as the Earth? How big would you like these? Oh, I think about our size. About our size. Pre preferably cute looking. Cute looking. Male, female? Uh, I'd like them in 56 different genders just to okay. broaden our sense of possibilities. <laughs> okay. As, your... as a parent, anyway, I believe that you having only two, two parents per child is grossly inadequate. You need at least 56 to handle children <laughs> I properly. I see. I'm not quite sure that many sex types produces 56 different parents. I think this just complicates the mating. So what is your favorite movie with aliens? My favorite movie with aliens, uh, Star Wars. Star Wars. And what, what do you like about it? The aliens in it? Uh, yes, I like the aliens amongst many other things. Soundtrack probably more than anything else. But Now, they're uh, all mammals, I think, in that movie. And they're all extremely humanoid, which once again is unrealistic, yes. but that's going back to the rational side of my brain. Uh -huh. Okay. Now, have you ever seen an alien? No. Uh, but I know of. Have you ever been... Abduct my students tell me I am an alien. You are. Okay. Have you been... A Do you think you're an alien? Uh, no. What's the evidence for that? Uh, DNA in my body. It's related to everybody else in the world. You've had it sequenced, have you? No, but uh, the similarity between myself and everybody else seems pretty overwhelming. Have you ever been abducted by an alien? Not personally, no. Ever been visited by aliens in your dreams? Nope. Ever seen a UFO? Uh, uh, have I seen something in space I don't understand? Yes. Um, so that's since technically a UFO. Do I think it was an alien? No. Okay. Uh, what do you think of the multiverse ideas? I like them on a philosophical level. There's, uh, to my mind, no evidence for or against them, but it's, it's a nice thing to contemplate. I don't know how you would ever test any of these ideas. Do you think they have anything to do with aliens? Like, for example, if there's a multiverse, let's suppose that the multiverse is a real picture and there are other universes, I guess there would be lots of aliens in these other universes. Multiverses mean there are more universes and so more chances to be aliens. So yes, the more multiverses there are, definitely the more aliens you're going to get. Okay. However, the less you're going to have to do with them, it could be all the aliens are in different multiverse. That's why we haven't seen any. A lot of these multiverse ideas talk about varying parameters, like yes. varying big G, varying alpha, varying uh, this, I don't know, speed of light. What do you think of the, that variability? Because they talk about our universe being fit for life because of the supposedly fine-tuning of these parameters. What do you think of that idea? It's a neat idea to explain why our universe is so fine-tuned. Uh, it's one of many possible hypotheses for why it's so fine-tuned. Uh, so you think it is fine-tuned? 
at our current level of understanding, there are a number of free parameters uh, which we have no reason for understanding why they have the value they do in our current particle physics type models. And if you adjust almost any of them by more than a trivial amount, you end up with a universe which is not suitable for life. So in that sense, the universe is fine-tuned. The question is, maybe at some point in the future we'll find a reason why these parameters have the values they do. It's not just at the moment, as far as we know, it's arbitrary for most of these parameters. Uh, but in the hi history of science, there have been many cases where arbitrary things have turned out to have perfectly good reasons for why they are the way they are. So you only are comfortable with the idea of fine-tuning if you make the further assumption that they could have been otherwise, and that's not necessarily a good assumption? Yes. Okay. In general, uh, I don't think we understand... I mean, there's always a realm in science where you can make some progress because there's experimental evidence, and then when you go beyond there's a speculative realm. The speculative realm is a lot of fun, uh, but I don't take anything in that realm too seriously until we've got some way of testing it. Wasn't think, that because you're an observer rather than a theorist? Yes, and I think it's also because I have a, a great respect for human ability of self-deceit. Uh, so looking through history, I think when people have been able to speculate unconstrained by data and evidence, they have usually got things wrong. And then when you apply that to yourself, that undermines the argument you just made. Um, yes, yeah, so, I mean... This, there can always be exceptions to scepticism, of course. Uh, so, uh, but this is the inductive principle of philosophy, that uh, you assume that what has happened in the past will happen in the future unless there's some good evidence to the contrary. And that's the underlying principle of most of science, I would say. Um, as Hume pointed out, there's absolutely no reason to believe it's true. Now, uh, a particle physicist, Lawrence Krauss, has said uh, we are a cosmic accident. What do you think he meant by that? I have no idea. You should ask him. Okay. <laughs> I'm right. sure you have. I, well, I, ha I have, but I didn't get a satisfactory answer. He said something like, uh, well, are we a cosmic accident because of the particular way the Higgs field froze? Could it have frozen? In, we talk about spontaneous symmetry breaking, and that implies it could have frozen in another way. Now, I think this is going back to the fine-tuning argument. Uh, and you know, with our current understanding of physics, there definitely there seems to be some fine-tuning. Uh, but again, that's our current level of understanding, and uh, that might well change. Now, the universe may be spatially infinite, and if that's the case, then anything that uh, could happen will happen an infinite number of times. That's not clear to me, to be honest. Okay, why? Um, I've often thought this would be a good student project to look at the competing infinities here. So I've often heard the argument, if, some, if the universe is infinite, then anything, no matter how unlikely it must happen somewhere in the universe, but I've often used it myself in public talks. Mm -hmm. But is it really true? I mean... You're talking about, um, in mathematics, there are many different types of infinity. Mm -hmm. LF0, LF1, and so on. There are countable infinities and uncountable infinities, and so on. And you're comparing two infinities here, the infinity of space against the infinite improbability of having another planet just like the Earth with another creature just like Charlie Lineweaver on it. Mm -hmm. And presumably one could take some sort of limit of as these two things as you take the radius of the universe to infinity and the probability to zero and see where the limit goes. And I have not done this. I don't know if anyone has. But it's not entirely clear to me where that limit will go. Well, if you have, sometimes I write zero equals one divided by infinity. But if you write those different types of infinities in the denominator there, then you have different types of zeros. Yes. And that's the kind of thing you're talking about. Yes. I mean, there's a whole well-developed mathematics of different types of infinity. I mean, in some sense, uh, this is calculus. Um, cal integration is dx by dy, which is zero over zero. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the, the art of differentiation is dividing zero by zero and getting 42. Mm -hmm. Integration is zero times infinity equals 42. All right, so, do you th so let me ask you, do you think there are an infinite number of uh, Paul Francis's in the universe? If the universe is spatially infinite? I, I don't know. I really don't know on that one. But you should I have could, a student be... project. It's such a trivial thing that you're putting a student on it rather than dedicating yourself to it. Yeah. <laughs> I think it would be, a, like most of these problems, the question would all be defining your terms and defi asking the question in a meaningful way. But I think it's an interesting thing that could be worked on. And I would imagine someone has already worked on it somewhere. Okay, now, Stephen Jay Gould, a biologist at Harvard, talked about okay. replaying the tape of life and what would happen. And he thought that if we replayed the tape of life going back, let's say, to the Cambrian explosion 540 million years ago, that hum nothing like human-like intelligence would evolve again. Other people, on the, hand, on, the, on the other hand, like Simon Conway Moore, said, oh, yes, it would. Do you have a, a, a horse in this race? Any opinion there? I don't know. Uh, it's, uh, I'll defer to the evolutionary theorists. I mean, it's clear there's a very large element of randomness in which way evolution works. 
uh, the question of how you developed intelligence in the hominids is a very interesting one that I don't think has been solved. The evidence is extremely scant about where exactly the first evolution happened and what, what steps were necessary to go to the very large brains we have and to what extent it was random chance or particularly unusual combinations of environment matching up with a particular climate change, matching up with a particular pre-existing genetic structure. Um, I, I wouldn't like to comment on which way this goes. I kind of hope it's a fairly common occurrence. It'd be nice to have lots of aliens out there in life, but I really don't know. So you'd like to find other humans, other humanoids? I'd like to discover intelligent aliens, yes. Maybe now, I'm an optimist. I think that might be but, nice. But other people have looked at what has happened when other tribes of humans have found other tribes of humans, and it's just a complete disaster of genocide. And so you want to be on the receiving end of some genocide. Is that what you just said? I suspect that the genocide is when the levels of intelligence are actually quite similar to each other, so you're competing for resources. So, for example, the genocide against the Aborigines, it's because the English wanted their land. Uh, so in space it's not really clear because there's essentially unlimited real estate. Uh, so a lot of the reasons why there has been genocide and ecological takeover and collapse is competing for scarce resources. When you're in space, the resources are not scarce. It's not clear that would happen. Well, well it depends on how fast your spaceship's going. <laughs> what do you think are the biggest misconceptions that people and students have about the question, are we alone? I think most people and students do not have a really good understanding of the time scales in the universe, just how old the universe is in a real gut feeling sense. We tend to think in time scales of days, months, years, maybe even decades, and not billions of years. And I think that leads to many misunderstandings about what's going on here. So for example, we look at evolution and say, well, that's incredibly unlikely. But then incredibly unlikely things will happen given you know, several billion years. Uh, so I think that's the biggest issue, that people really have no comprehension of how deep cosmic time is. Cosmic space and how big it is is also a problem, but I think that's less of a conceptual gap than cosmic time for most people. Now, do you have any, uh, well, the misconceptions, so that's, you mentioned one misconception or two. When you give public talks, do you run into these misconceptions about are we alone? I mean, any others? That's the one I think is most important, but of course, like most misconceptions, the people who have it don't realise they have it. The most difficult misconceptions are the ones that are so built in that people don't even realise they're having it. I think uh, most people have not thought very much about life in space, and they get their ideas in some fairly shallow way from you know, TV shows, and so they're thinking of, you know, like Star Wars or Aliens, which are mostly humanoid and which you can have ray gun battles with, uh, and fly around in flying saucers and abduct chosen lunatics from remote rural areas of the United States. Um, and that's certainly a misconception lots of people have, simply because it's all they've seen. Um, um, now, well, students will be watching this video, and some of them will want to become astrobiologists. Do you have any advice for these future astrobiologists of the world? Run away, run away, <laughs> don't do it. <sighs> to my mind, this is a very dangerous field to get into because it's basically... It's a speculative field. There is no data, to, well, there are null results at this point. Uh, so I think it starts becoming very interesting once we have the first microbe from Mars or something like that. Until that stage, uh, it's speculative. I think there's probably more people working in it than we really need to work in it, given the complete lack of data. Oh, so kind of like dark matter studies. Well, we have data for dark matter. <laughs> Not much, but a lot more than we have for life in space. Well, a lot of people think that the, the recent discovery of planets, Earth-like planets everywhere, is progress and the best kind of progress you can have in science. And that's why a lot of astronomy is moving in that direction. You disagree yes, with so, that? Um, I mean, the, we, I, I think it's a very similar sort of thing. That, astrobiologists consider that part of astrobiology. Well, I'll take your definition. I mean, that's, that's, that, to my mind, that's a prime example. There were no jobs in studying extracellular planets until the first ones were discovered. Now it's a huge growth area. Mm -hmm. Um, so there were a few people working on it beforehand, studying the theories about how these things might form and possible ways in which you might observe them. In the end, the discovery came from a quite different technique. So it wasn't the people who were trying to discover planets or other stars that discovered them in the first place. It was people looking at other you know, binary stars. 
Um, and so it's, uh, but then it became boom time. So I think at the moment astrobiology is, is probably in a sociological point of view sustained by space program money uh, for Mars missions and the like. And in the countries which have space programs, which is not Australia, that's a large pool of money available, and that keeps a lot of these things going. And uh, but I think, and there are some interesting insights, such as your own work on how the, uh, looking at the origins of life may affect you know, an understanding of, for example, cancers in cells. Um, so there are interesting insights to be gained. But I don't think the field is going to come very large until we have a detection, just like we didn't have an exoplanet wasn't a very large field until we had a detection. But part of astrobiology also is trying to figure out how life got started on this planet, and that also is, seems to be a booming field now. Now that is, I, I wouldn't consider that astrobiology, I'd consider that a study of the origin, I mean, it's, it's clearly related to astrobiology. Astrobiology is kind of a multidisciplinary field, and so it pulls in things, and you can draw the boundary to include all the things it's pulling in or not as you see fit. So I'd say the study of origins of life on Earth is, is a very important and interesting field and a good one to get involved in because we do have data about that. But that's also central to astrobiology. It is central to astrobiology. Um, so if you mean astrobiology is including that and including exoplanets, then yes, by all means. Well, I do, I do. If you <laughs> I define, think everybody does. If I define astrobiology as the study of life outside the Earth, well, that's, you know, then it's a much smaller field because there's no data. I see. Okay. So, so your comment, if you're going to get involved in astrobiology, get involved in finding exoplanets or investigating the origin of life, but not just sitting in a chair speculating about whether there's life elsewhere. Is that what... Yeah, but there's a role for some people to speculate about <laughs> that. Um, but I w wouldn't say it's going to be big until we have some data. Now, in the and it could be that if, if, we do, if we get evidence coming out of the origin of life on Earth that it's inevitable that, or very highly probable that life will form in suitable planets. Mm. Uh, then, then it starts becoming quite interesting because then it's, it's now pretty clear from exoplanets that at least Earth mass planets are pretty common. Uh, that doesn't mean Earth chemistry or Earth temperature planets. Earth temperature planets have got to be pretty common now. I think the evidence is now fairly secure on that. So if we have those two clues in place, we know that there are going to be a lot of Earth-like planets and we know that if, if there is an Earth-like planet, the origin of at least mic micro life is pretty inevitable then it starts becoming interesting because then there's pretty much got to be at least microcellular life in profusion. Would I still work in that field? It's, again, it's not quite clear what I'd do unless there was some, some reasonable chance of a mission to actually look at it. I see. Okay. Now, have you seen the movie Contact? I have, yes. Now, in the movie Contact, several times somebody says, well, are we alone? And the clever answer back is, well, if we are, it's an awful waste of space. Now, what do you think of that answer? Not much. Um, waste of space implies that space should be used, and there is some set of rules saying what you should do with all your space, none of which we have any idea about. So I would think, just from a probabilistic point of view, if there are that many billions upon billions of planets, it seems odd that there wouldn't be life, some of them, which is a slightly different argument. But the waste of space, I mean, if you're talking about waste of space in your house, it's because space is valuable and there's someone like you who wants to use it. Uh, but it's not clear either of those two things apply in the universe. 